the venerable monks and nuns and uh, respected sisters and brothers, my uh, humble uh, greetings and uh, uh, good evening to you all. In the beginning, at the outset, I would like to uh, acknowledge and welcome the leaders and members of the uh, local political, religious, and uh, community organizations who are with us here. And uh, apart from that, all our local friends who have come tonight for this uh, talk. The audience who is also following the talk via video, I uh, welcome you all. I was asked to uh, talk on the subject or topic, what Buddhism has to offer the modern world. It is uh, uh, a kind of un unfamiliar uh, topic for me. So at the beginning, I must uh, apologize that I do not have any prepared presentation or speech. We might discuss, we might discuss what Buddhism has to offer to the modern world, but I do not have anything to offer to you which is uh, what's well uh, uh, to be, uh, uh, to be uh, considered as offering. The Tibetan Buddhist monks are more habitual of uh, accepting offerings and not offering to others. <laughs> That's why the uh, communist Chinese leaders accused the Tibetan Buddhist people, Buddhist lamas and monks, as uh, yellow robbers and uh, uh, red thieves. That's referring to uh, Rinpoches and the monks. They are considered to be uh, exploiters of the community or the society. That was communist view. However, I think there's some important matter if we uh, look into uh, this topic uh, more seriously. What Buddhism has to offer the modern world. So first we have to uh, discuss what is Buddhism? And then we have to discuss what is the world or modern world. And only thereafter we might be able to uh, find out whether anything has to offer or nothing uh, is to offer. Buddhism, uh, many people uh, understood as uh, one of the uh, religious traditions, no more, no less. Uh, that concept that understanding might not comprehend exactly what is Buddhism. Buddhism 
is not exactly a religion in the strict uh, terms, in strict uh, connotation of the term. In India, there's uh, an expression some of the scholars used to say that the Islamic is a, a holy religion. The Hinduism is a way of life. Buddhism is a science and philosophy. So there might be some difference between the various traditions. I definitely do not say that Buddhism is uh, superior to any other religious tradition. I'm only say that there are differences, there are similarities, and there are also dissimilarities. So without noticing the dissimilarities, we were not able to uh, understand all religious traditions uh, as uh, equal, then uh, you may not be able to uh, understand the greatness of uh, each one of the uh, religious traditions. Each one of the religious traditions are so great, so holy, so we shall have to respect every religion equally. Therefore, the Mahatma Gandhi interprets his uh, concept of secularism as a Sarva Dharma Sambhava. Sarva Dharma Sambhava means absolutely equal respect to every religion, no distinction between any religion. That is the real secularism in his view. Of course, the other Indian uh, people translated the English word secularism as uh, Dharma Nirpechta. There's something very um, um, horrible. Uh, it says, uh, we are not uh, uh, concerned to any religion. Nirpech means uh, just uh, ignore, nor um, uh, taking note of. So that is the, not uh, the many of secularism. Of course, the secularism can be interpreted in many ways. Um, negation of religion, against religion, or uh, not uh, um, abiding by the religious uh, um, tenets well in the process of lawmaking. So there are different ways of uh, interpreting it. But what Gandhi said is the uh, most appropriate thing to have uh, respect, equal respect to every religion, not distinction. But a person shall have to practice uh, one religion, one's own religion, and try to stick to it throughout life. Unless there is a very uh, reasonable cause or convincing logical cause, the change of religion is uh, not a good thing for a, a respectable human, human being. In spite of no difference between their different religious traditions, yet there is a suitability 
to human individuals. That's why His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, always says the uh, uh, numerous different traditions of religions is a necessity to different humanity. One religious tradition is not enough to the uh, entirety of the humanity. That's true. For example, to sustain our physical body, we need uh, food, drink, and uh, cloth. But uh, there cannot be one kind of uh, food and one kind of uh, uh, drink and one kind of cloth if you make the entire seven billion people asked to uh, wear just one kind of cloth and just one kind of food. Absolutely impossible. It will not uh, make the people happy. It will not uh, uh, make people uh, uh, comfortable. Each individual has a different kind of test. Not only test, suitability to uh, his or her body, and therefore so many different kind of preparations and foods are necessary. But it does not mean certain group of food is uh, more superior than the uh, other food or certain group of drink is more superior than the other drinks. All of them are good for uh, those persons who are suiting to that. So similarly, religion, philosophy, and uh, any kind of knowledge that is uh, very much necessary for the diverse aptitude, diverse level of uh, liking and disliking, and uh, uh, intelligence and uh, capability of understanding. So there need to be so many different things. So in this context, uh, Buddhism has uh, so many dissimilarities with the other religious traditions. So those dissimilarities need to be recognized and uh, find out whether these things are relevant or beneficial to a uh, present day's humanity or for that matter, entire sentient being, including the, uh, um, the earth, the environment, and everything. <coughs> Buddhism deals with three things in the process of uh, uh, communicating the Dharma. First, it deals with the base. Second, it deals with the path. And third, it talks about the uh, ultimate goal or the result. The path belongs to only Dharma. And uh, dealing with the base, the ground, it is a searching of the nature of phenomenon and the nature of mind. The inquiry, the, uh, the analyzation to uh, find out what is the exact nature, how the mind and how the phenomenon do exist and how the mind and phenomenon has a, a relationship. These things are either belonging to a philosophy or the science. The Buddhist science do not have a 
any external laboratory or tools to uh, make experiments. The entire the science makes this experiment within the laboratory of the mind through analyzation, visualization, or concentration. It uh, tries to improve the mind in order to uh, experiment on the matter or on the phenomenon in a more better way. Instead of developing the external tools or instruments. So the mind is trained in concentrative stability meditation, analytical sharp meditation, and uh, enlargement of the uh, intelligence and power of understanding. And by that, it tries to uh, find out the uh, reality of the uh, mind and matter or mind and phenomenon. They do the search quite similarly, the search the modern scientists do. That's why there is a possibility of uh, engagement and dialogue between the uh, Buddhist people and the modern science people. His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, give a great importance to a engagement between these two. Although I personally do not participate in this process, but I know the importance and the progress. For the last more than uh, 30 years, more than uh, 25 conferences or dialogues have been uh, taking place in various parts of the world. And uh, a number of, number of different, uh, very uh, celebrated scientists has uh, taken part. And uh, they do appreciate that there is a possibility of engagement and through which more insights can be uh, built up and beneficial to both from Dharma to uh, uh, from Buddhist science to uh, modern science from modern science to uh, Buddhist, Buddhist uh, studies. That's why his Holiness encouraged all the Buddhist monastic institutions in India to introduce introductory course in uh, various modern sciences so that the Dharma people may not be absolutely ignorant of the uh, basic of the uh, principles, basic principles of the modern science. So there's a lot of uh, interaction and a lot of dialogue. So Buddhism shall have to be uh, seen as a, a, a subject uh, which includes the uh, inquiry into the nature of uh, entire phenomenon and also the mind, both mind and matter, through which the reality of the existing can be discovered, revealed, and understood. Thereby, the uh, perception and uh, the cognition can be improved and enlarged. Then also, 
Buddhism do have references or discussions or principles on the matters of social, economic and politics. These are the basis of development of modern world, the contemporary world. Buddhist in depthly deals with the uh, right livelihood and uh, on that basis the Bhutanese has uh, come out in a theory and a, and a principle instead of uh, uh, national uh, gross income production, they talk about uh, national gross happiness. And uh, this uh, principle is completely drawn out of the uh, Buddhist principles of uh, socio-economic uh, development theory. Sometimes it's a funny. A few months back, I met a researcher at uh, Hyderabad, and uh, she was uh, quite unhappy. And uh, with anxiety, she uh, come to us and discuss. So I asked her, uh, what is the matter? He says, it is very difficult to find out uh, a yardstick to measure the happiness. <laughs> so what is necessary to uh, um, measure the happiness? Happiness is happiness. She says, no, no, I'm working on the uh, uh, principle of national growth happiness, and uh, there must be, when we theorizing it, there must be certain yardstick and uh, uh, certain uh, cross-cutting uh, 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 principles through which the uh, gross amount of happiness can be measured and uh, put, into, uh, put into categories or statistics. So we laughed. So <laughs> Happiness is a dead, very difficult uh, to be uh, uh, maintained and to be achieved if you do not have the basic, uh, uh, what I should say, basic uh, uh, technique. Anything can become a cause of unhappiness as we uh, discussed uh, the other day. <coughs> So similarly, the Buddha's teaching has a lot of things about the uh, political systems, particularly the uh, principles of democracy, equality, and uh, all these things. 2,500 years ago, Buddha set up his uh, Bhikkhu Sangha and Bhikkhu Nisangha, complete in the system of uh, equality and democracy. There was no singular authority. Each one of the uh, member of Sangha is equal when uh, something decision-making forces our rule-making process is uh, carried out as a Sangha karma. This Sangha system is uh, one of the basic models for a parliamentary system in India. Of course, India do have a parliamentary system and republics during the time of Buddha as well. Uh, the first uh, principles of democracy was uh, coming from India 
And therefore, even that 2,500 years ago, there was a, a number of republics in India, partic particularly the Vaishali, that was the biggest republic. And Buddha have uh, make all the uh, Vinay rules on the basis of democracy. So that's why there are a number of uh, researches and uh, books on the social philosophy of Buddhism or political philosophy of Buddhism uh, on the basis of uh, the Buddha's teachings. So therefore, Buddhism is a vast subject and it has uh, reference to uh, almost every aspect of human life, human individual life, as well as uh, the concerns of the uh, uh, society. So we shall have to take Buddhism as a, a, a source of uh, social science, a source of uh, political system, and also a source of uh, uh, material science and philosophy. So if we look to uh, entire these aspects, then we will be able to whether there is something can be taken by the contemporary world from the Buddhism or there is nothing. So first, the necessity is uh, to understand what is Buddhism. Then coming to the uh, modern world, <coughs> the first day when I was told your uh, public talk is on the uh, uh, what uh, Buddhism has to offer to the modern world. Uh, I asked the organizers, uh, due to my ignorance, what is uh, modern, what is modernity? <coughs> are, are we still in the modernity or post-modernity? <laughs> because there are so many different uh, um, definitions and interpretations of modern, modernity, and modernization. So they very kindly give me from the uh, sources what is modern, but at this moment we are not going to discuss them. We shall take the modern world means world of today, the present contemporary world. The contemporary world need to uh, look closely and uh, what is the situation of the contemporary world? We always think that uh, after modernization, the nations, they are emancipated, they are liberated, and uh, they come to a, a very uh, great time, and there is no problem. This is a general uh, concept, or this should be general concept, otherwise why we talk about modernity. His Holiness tells us, once uh, he was uh, invited by uh, the late Queen Mother in the UK, at that time she was around 100 years old, and uh, but she was very active and uh, alert. And His Holiness asked her, you lived for a century, and uh, can you tell me the old days during your young age was better, or the today, uh, the world today is better? And she very enthusiastically tells His Holiness, oh, it is much better today. And when I was a child and I was a teenager, there was uh, not much of equality between the uh, gender differences, the male and the female, and there's not much democracy, no talk about human rights, and uh, 
lot of domination and uh, injustice. Now we are in a, in a period, democracy, human right, gender equality, and uh, freedom of individual, all these are available. So the things are much better. So in a way, she's right, because these days we talk a great deal about this. We talk a great deal of uh, equality, democracy, human rights, freedom, liberty, and so many things, very good words. But in reality, do we have all this? There are a lot of uh, contradiction in our life, not only in individu individual's life, the life as whole, human society, and the life of nations. For example, we uh, take the issue of democracy. What are the principles of democracy? If we uh, look uh, to the uh, highest or the biggest organization, the so-called UNO, United Nations Organization, which had around uh, 200 member nations, I think 198 or 197. Around 200 member nations, all the decisions are taken by one nation. And we accept it as a democracy. So if this is a democracy, then what is wrong with the kings and the queens and the emperors? Um, if one nation or one person is able to take a decision on behalf of the entirety, the membership, In the nation's level, Gandhi had remarked the parliamentary democratic system uh, very severely in his uh, Kindu Swaraj. Um, I met a political science professor from Taiwan, Formosa. And at that time, Formosa was uh, newly democratized and uh, multi-party demo democratic system was set up and uh, the presidential elections were concluded. I just congratulated him that you have a very smooth transition from a totalitarian to a, a multi-party democratic system. I congratulate you. And he uh, paused for a while Yes, you are vulnerable, but uh, I don't know it is for better or for worse for our nation, I can't say. So I was taken aback. He was not an ordinary person. He was a professor of political science. He should have reacted that, yes, now we are democratized. We are so great and so on and so forth. Then I ask, why you are uh, so uh, pessimistic about the, your democratization? He said very seriously, Yes, there was a, a kind of totalitarian, but at that time, everybody thinks for interest of the nation, the total population. Now we have a, a multi-party democracy. The party interests are much more giving importance than the national interest. If there is a, a crucial interest of the party, which is uh, contrary to the national interest, they will not hesitate to uh, take decisions on that direction. So this gave me a new uh, information, and then I look to all the multi-party democratic, democratic systems, my host country, India, 
during the time of Indira Gandhi, during the time of emergency, then thereafter the time of Janta Party and how the Janta Party was dis disintegrated, and then what other parties had come and all the uh, coalition governments and this and that. It, it was uh, very much correct that parties' short-term interests are much more important than the uh, country's interest in long run. So the so-called democratic system has uh, enormous loopholes and uh, which generates to uh, corruption and uh, misappropriation of finance. And so all these are due to the uh, importance of the uh, uh, political parties and so on and so forth. The human right, we have a human right, universal human right declaration. When UN made this uh, um, declaration, Gandhi remarked that this would not help anything to the human humanity. And somebody asked why? This is a, a declaration of only rights. There's no mention of duty and responsibility. In the absence of duty and responsibility, how the rights can be protected? So Gandhi remarked as early as 1942. And now uh, it is quite uh, obvious, quite clear, that declaration is not able to uh, protect the human right. After that declaration, how many countries has a, a gross violation of human right is very clear. One Indian researcher have done a research work on the proceedings of the uh, Human Rights Commission from right its inception to 1996. And thereafter, I don't know. And after that, uh, he, uh, uh, she recorded all the proceedings, and uh, more than uh, 400 or 500 resolutions were passed. And not a single resolution was based on ground reality or merits. The entire resolutions have been passed on the basis of uh, the block which block and the other block and the, this block. So in reality, wherever the human rights have been uh, violated, they are not being able to condemn or redress. All the resolutions either put for the postponement or not able to pass due to the partisan among the nations. My late friend uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti was uh, invited to uh, give a talk in the one of the UN's uh, offices, culture offices um, in uh, New York. And he started uh, his talk, it was very interesting. He says, nations can never be united. If you have to unity, you have to give up the sense of nationhood, uh, nationalism. So it seems to be a very correct one. Uh, these are the external things. The real problem of today is the increase of violence to sentient beings and to nature, and thereby the degradation of uh, environment that uh, threatens to not only the living creatures, but even the plants, trees, animals, water, glaciers, and everything's been uh, greatly uh, disturbed the global warming and uh, the uh, climate change, 
on which uh, successive conventions have been uh, organized. Everybody talk about the uh, real situation. I am very clearly remember around uh, 20 years before or 30 years before when we uh, raised the question of environment degradation Many scientists will say, yes, there is some damage, but we will find some remedy. The scientific knowledge is uh, capable of uh, finding all remedies, whatever may be damaged here and there. So these are small things, and on the contrary, we are making a great uh, leap forward in the progress. So we will find out some remedy to uh, repair the damage of the environment. But now, for the last round, uh, 15, uh, 16 years, the majority of science people says we cannot do anything, we have no remedy. The science will not uh, able to find any way to stop, to reduce, or to repair what the damage has been done to the environment. And unless and until we change our lifestyle, to change something drastically, um, make a decision for the betterment of the environment, there's no way to uh, restore it. It's uh, our lifetime experience. I live in India, place like uh, Ladakh. The whole year they used to have a half inch rain or one inch rain. So therefore, all the uh, house roofs are not waterproof, they're not necessary to make traditionally. And there was a flood three years before, and more than uh, 400 people died. And uh, this kind of visible change in the environment. And this year, I lived in India during the last uh, three, four months, the uh, monsoon season, the half of India is suffered by drought and the half of India is uh, drawn in the flood. So, great disaster. And all these are not uh, speculation, not theory. We do experience um, um, directly and uh, 30 years before, we used to uh, travel uh, by train anywhere in India. We take water from the uh, railway stations and drink it. Today, we can't take water. We have to carry water with uh, us or give money to the multinational companies to purchase a bottle of drinkable water. And all the waters are being polluted. The basic uh, necessity for survival of humanity, not only humanity, survival of any uh, living creature, the water is uh, necessary and which has been polluted, including the rivers and the water from the wall or underground water. Everything is uh, polluted. The entire water in the Punjab area polluted, and from one district, there are 40,000 uh, cancer patients which are now recognized as a result of excessive use of chemical fertilizers on the uh, field and which goes onto the groundwater and which cause uh, such a uh, great number of uh, cancer diseases. So this kind of thing so we don't have now drinkable water, and it, the day will not be far away. We shall uh, not have a, a, a clean uh, year to breathe. So today we carry water, and uh, then one day will come, we shall have to carry back of uh, uh, oxygen to breathe. Otherwise the entire um, uh, uh, year would be polluted. So this is the real situation of today. 
violence, violence become a trade. So no one going to reduce violence. Everybody talk about uh, fighting against terrorism. No one is uh, really willing to uh, put an end to terrorism because putting an end to terrorism or putting an end to war or possibility of war means reduction of market for weapons. And uh, the market industry needs uh, market. Uh, the uh, the uh, weapon industry needs a market. And the weapon industries are not going to change their production. And their market can only be available or sustained if there's use of the weapons, destructive weapons. And, and if there's no use of the destructive weapons, then uh, this uh, uh, productions of these industries will not have a uh, market or profit. So therefore, it is a, a necessity of an economic section. The demand of weapon is depend on the consumption of weapon. And the consumption of we weapon can only be possible if there is a war or there is a threat of war or there's continuity of uh, 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 terrorism. So all these are very clearly visible to everyone. But no one is uh, willing to uh, make a change, a shift to these policies. In the past, there was uh, ignorance. People do not know much of uh, the result of environment de degradation. Now everybody knows it. And it is dangerous that it also knows the scarcity of water is going to come, or the um, scarcity of uh, uh, rising of sea level is going to come. Climate change is uh, very visible. In spite of this, no one is had a, has a will uh, to, uh, to address to these problems, the serious problems. So, um, what we should say, it is uh, uh, knowingly inviting a kind of suicide. The earth is going to be destroyed by environment degradation, and uh, everybody knows it, and in spite of that, after conventions and conventions, they are not able to reach an agreement to address to this problem. And uh, there's no uh, will or agreement to reduce the use of destructive weapons or production of destruct uh, dis destructive weapons. And apart from that, anyone can very easily understand that the production of mass destructive weapons not going to be used or going to be used, they will use one and then need not to use over and over again. One weapon is enough to uh, destroy the entire planet Earth. But still we are keep on to produce them and uh, accumulate them. A numerous number of people are starving, having no food, having no shelter, having no cloth, having no medical treatment, having no um, uh, any uh, uh, security and education that is very visible. In spite of that, we spend the majority of amount on such useless things such as uh, production of weapon or uh, compilation of uh, uh, mass destructive weapons or um, harming to the um, environment and uh, so on and so forth. So therefore, this uh, concept of uh, modernity and modern culture need to uh, reexamine relook 
and uh, everybody must have a certain uh, degree of uh, common sense. If they are not uh, concerned for other people, they must concern for themselves. So this is, I think, a very, very um, urgent issue for everyone. It's therefore the teaching of uh, universal responsibility, the teaching of a compassionate mind, and uh, the teaching of uh, treating every sentient being as equal or as a potential of uh, evolving up to the uh, evolving up to the uh, enlightenment. These uh, few um, basic uh, principles, not relating to any ism, it can be uh, protested by even non believers, uh, which uh, contained in a Buddhist uh, uh, canon, Buddhist literature, can be used by the uh, humanity, and I think uh, it will be used because uh, I'm noticing last 53 years, people drawn to the Buddhist principles in a very rapid way. And there are so many people are now interested into the Buddhism. Whosoever is interested into Buddhism I would uh, encourage them and uh, I would uh, request them to take whatever is uh, practicable, applicable to their life, they should take. And they need not to become a Buddhist. Everybody should uh, better to remain whatever their uh, traditional uh, faith or traditional religion, but the compassionate is not contradicting to any religion. The sense of universal responsibility do not contradict any religion, any faith. And uh, a sense of respect to every life uh, do not contradict any religion. So these things, we may not, uh, we may not, we Buddhist people may not be able to uh, offer appropriately to you but you can take them. This is nobody's private property. The Buddha's teachings are, uh, in a sense, there's no copyright. And uh, everybody may, uh, may learn them, may uh, 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 inquire into them, and uh, may adopt them, and there, thereby we might be able to uh, do something to save the planet, we have uh, so many challenges at this moment. The modern world has uh, more challenges than our available facilities. There are challenge of uh, increase of population. There is a challenge of uh, increase of uh, economic uh, disparity and uh, artificial uh, economic recessions, and uh, there are challenges of uh, um, gap between haves and have-nots, and there are challenges of the ever-increasing uh, threatening, uh, life-threatening violence everywhere. No one is uh, feel uh, safe nowhere. Each day, Whenever I go to the um, aer uh, aerodrome, so everyone is a suspected person. Everyone is considered to be possible th uh, terrorists. And we have to uh, remove shoe, and we have to remove head and turban to go through the uh, security. So, so scared, so feared. So each one of the passengers, human beings, are considered to be a potential threat to someone else. How this, uh, how we can feel 
we are living a civilized society or civilized humanity. Sometimes it's very depressing. Uh, this is the challenge of the uh, 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 increase of uh, violence. Violence industry and violence market, the violence uh, trade, that is threatening to us. And uh, environment degradation, having no water, having no air clean, and how we can survive. And uh, finally, the source of emancipation, source of liberation to everyone is considered to be the religious traditions. The religious traditions are most disappeared and the name and institutions are left. Now the name of religious, religious traditions and the religious institutions are again used for division of humanity and conflict. There is a expression, religious intolerance. This is very funny in, uh, impression, very funny language. If someone is religious minded, he or she can never be intolerant. If someone is intolerant, the person can never be a religious person. But we coined a uh, expression, religious intolerance, religious disharmony. So this is also, the religions are also, the humanity have made something uh, problem, something threat to the unity of the humanity. So it's great time, it is urgent time to think seriously and do something for the betterment of humanity. I'm not uh, making a very uh, pessimistic statement. Of course, there are so many good things uh, you might have seen, but whatever I have mentioned is uh, not an exaggerated lie. It is a ground reality which we are experiencing day in and day out. So therefore, if we have a certain sense of a responsibility, accountability as a human being, then we must uh, pay attention to the sense of uh, responsibility and awareness of our accountability and as a member of human society, what we ought to do. And for that matter, whatever the Buddhist canon has something uh, to be useful and that you can take as an offer of the uh, Buddhism. I think uh, I should stop here. My uh, um, my summation, what I have said to you, is a not very pleasant one, and a not very uh, 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 encouraging one. Um, this is uh, how uh, my. Uh, my thought and my words have been uh, uh, just come out the flow. Otherwise, I should have talked uh, the beautiful things. We can offer this and we can offer that and Buddhism can offer so, uh, so many things and the modern world is so beautiful. Uh, if I talk in that way, it, it would have been better. But uh, the reality which is in front of our eye and which we are experiencing throughout our life, that comes out. And uh, if somebody uh, felt it unpleasant, I apologize and I wish you all um, happy and uh, meaningful life. Um, I used to uh, say to my friends, if you uh, wish to have a happy life, you need three things. A good health, 
a sound mind and a non-violent livelihood. If you uh, wish to uh, uh, have a, a meaningful life, then uh, you need four things. These three, good health, sound mind, and uh, right livelihood, and then a spiritual learning, a spiritual practice. Then you will have a, a meaningful life. Just happy life, the three is enough. And uh, to, to make the, your life meaningful, then you need input of spirituality. Whatever religion you may belong to, or even you may not belong to any religion, you are a, you are a, um, a non-believer, still uh, you have a, a inner sight, and uh, you must have a, a source of spirit. So spirituality not necessarily belonging to any religious set. So therefore, a spirituality, spirituality means a treatment to your mind, not only treatment to your body, uh, uh, a kind of uh, nourishing of the mind and the inner side of humanity is also necessary. Thank you very much for your attention.